Part five. Here we are. The number of grace. <laughs> right. Hey everybody, I'm Tiffany Thomas. And I'm Richard Thomas. Thanks so much for being part of the Lionheart Institute family. We are very excited to finally bring you part five of our five-part series on American slavery. It's been powerful. And when you look at Black History Month, I don't think you can talk about it without talking about slavery. Yeah. But I, I never imagined we would dive into this deep of a hole. Right. Um, and climb out with this much information for the people to really yeah. digest and dialogue about. And I know it's not all inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to talk about when Absolutely. it comes to slavery in America. But it is a great jump start. And yeah. uh, we think that you'll really grow from it. We think it will challenge your perception. Um, hopefully you'll be able to dialogue in, about it in a way that brings you to the next level and gives you some, some tools to talk about with your friends, your family members, even your children, um, as you help them really understand racism and the effects of racism and slavery in America. Right. Only with truth can you instill change in this country or in anything. And so we are hopeful that you will find some of that in these videos. Um, you know, please, if you haven't had a chance, subscribe to our channel. We appreciate so you. We value you. Uh, you know, and definitely interact with us below. Give us a comment. Tell us your thoughts. Like and share as well. Sit back and enjoy part five a little bit about some of the atrocities committed to slaves so we're going to talk a little bit more about their actual treatment um, like day-to-day -day life kind of go into a little bit more detail of that um, in 1667 uh, the slave codes were actually created and they were put in place to further solidify plantation owners power over enslaved people and to further the concept of societal slavery norm and so that was really important. And these codes also prohibited punishment for the rape of an enslaved person. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Um, now, we kind of talked a little bit about the, the field slaves versus the house slaves, the hours they worked, the 12 hours in the field, 16 hours in the house, but, or 18 hours in the house. But it, we should note that they worked six days a week. Yeah. So they, they didn't have a nine to five Monday through Friday. They had to work six days a week. And the only day they were allowed off was Sunday. And that's because the slave owners went to church and sometimes they would take their slaves with them um, to church, some of them. Um, but that was the only day a week that they did not have to work. Now, we kind of talked a little bit about this when it came to the Confederate soldiers not owning slaves, but not all people owned slaves in the South, especially if you were poor, um, which we kind of mentioned about. Now, slavery, however, was something everyone supported in the South because slave owners was something they all aspired to be, as we mentioned with the Confederate soldiers. This was a way of life for them. This was a society norm for them. So they wanted to own slaves. Now, here's where it gets interesting because even poor white people who could not afford slaves still knew that they were not slaves and they were not black. They gained power simply by being white. And that is where the concept of white privilege comes from. So slave owners owned the rights to all of their slaves to do with what they wanted. We, we've, we've heard this. They were property. We know this. They had the rights to sell whole families. They had the rights to sell off individual family members for profit, which they often did. And they often did this as punishment to slaves um, or ways to pay their own personal debts. They also gave slaves away to their grown children or their fa other family members as wedding gifts, as we kind of mentioned with, with the women. Um, now, once slave children reached the ages, um, oh, I was wrong, from 12 to 14, then they were considered ready to leave the home and they would sell them be off um, and be independent slaves. Correct. Um, now, generally, it was completely illegal for slaves to marry. So, you know, we talk about family units today. We, we hear the whole concept of, you know, the, the fatherless black children, black men never in the home, you know, the absent dads. So we hear of this a lot, but you have to understand this is something that was done to black families. This was something we did to them. We destroyed their family units. We weren't, we, we, we tore their children away for them. We didn't allow them to marry, you know, 
these were this was a, a, a unit that we created and th that's still being said sorry to interrupt no, you. no you're fine that's still being said yeah the percentage or the presence of black fathers mm -hmm. um, or the lack of presence of black fathers in their children's lives is grossly overestimated today yes okay? so yes. while i agree with you that we are a society that created trends habits models for this to occur right. where, where black men were not a portion of their family the reality is that the percentages that are presented to society are so off they're skewed yeah absolutely. tremendously skewed um while the reality is that sometimes they do not match traditional uh wedding certificate right models that does right. not mean that black men are not present yes. in their children's lives that there's not family units or that there's not family units right. so family units sometimes look different that is right? true yeah uh very similar to the way that a, a we would not say that a uh, truck driver was not present in their child's life right if they have a, a marriage certificate even though they're gone six months out of the year right right, right. and so we give that credit to the white caucasian father because he yep. has his name on a certificate yep. however that does not mean that he's any more of a present mm -hmm. father than a black man is and i, I just take a an, an industry that i know one of my pastor friends is getting into best wishes in that uh, because he's a great father, very uh -huh. present with his his children. Yeah, uh, he's not. He's he's uh, he's Puerto Rican with a white um, wife as well. Um, but I'm saying that because it skews the stats. The stats yes. are not always accurate in right. the sense of how present right. African American men are in their children's lives. Some of which they're even harassed for not paying child support, mm -hmm. but they're still present in their children's life. Right. Um, they may not pay it through the court. They may go bring them shopping and so forth. Right. And I'm not saying that, that there isn't some issues with deadbeat dads as well. But I am saying that there is some skewing of the statistic yeah. that that we share. Okay, oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is just essentially to show that we created this, this lifestyle. This model. And this model, and we used it against black America today. And even as you said, even though that's not really the truth of what it looks like today, but we have used that against you, even mm -hmm. though we created it. Um, but there are some powerful stories, right? Uh -huh. um, one of which I hope you're about to share of people who were fighting the system, driving to be engaged in their, in their family's life. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them Mr. Box, right? Mm -hmm. um, share a little bit about that as, as, as you transition through this mm -hmm. during the process. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will definitely get to that story because I think it's really powerful. Um, it's powerful to understand, too, that, that uh, slaves were not allowed to co-parent their children. Um, they, they were not allowed to choose their own sexual partners. Um, however, I, I think it's important to note that slaves still created their own family units within their their community right. and even though they weren't legally allowed to so to, to hold those marriages they still married each other mm -hmm. they still chose to have families still jumped the burn even right even though they knew there was a possibility that that could be ripped from them mm -hmm. they still held on hope um to holding their families together and still not living life they, they chose to still live and yeah. still to create that that lifestyle and that family unit because it was important to them so good um now many enslaved people later later on went on to talk about the psychological trauma that they suffered um you know as i said of having their families torn from them their children sold their their spouses attacked you know their children attacked um you know something that isn't greatly talked about a lot that you know needs to be mentioned too is while the the rape of female black slave is very prevalent there was also a significant amount of rape of black men not only by the the wives but by the slave owners themselves mm -hmm. and that is something that is a very traumatic part of our history that isn't talked about at all it's not even really mentioned at all but it was very very prevalent um in that okay so now the story of uh henry the box brown yes tell and I and I, I I didn't want to rush you here, uh -huh. uh, but I love this story, right? <laughs> the desperation, the yeah. anger, the uh, passion for life, right? Um, here you have a whole society that's been abused. Yeah, you, they've seen their children sold at auction mm -hmm. or left at auction while they're sold to someone else, right? Mm -hmm. You hear the voice of the mother crying for their child. I, right. I mean, I if you close your eyes and you can imagine an auction block, you can imagine the first thing that would come to this. 
to this poor mother who's being sold off. Yeah. It's where are my children? Who's going to take care of my babies? Right. I, mean, I, I you can't know, even imagine. I, just the ripping torment of it. And then you have this story, which you yeah. know, it, it ends up somewhat triumphant. So it, it has a little bit of humor to it um, among the tragedy. So Henry Brown, after witnessing his siblings being sold off on the plantation that he grew up in, um, and ultimately he was sold off as well, he swore that he was never going to have a family of his own, which I would imagine was a common feeling that a lot of slaves had. Um but then one day he met and fell in love with another slave by the name of Nancy. And um, unlike most slaves, Nancy and Henry were actually allowed to marry. Now this, even though it was rare, the slave owners were allowed to be able to say, yes, you can get married, even though it technically wasn't a legal certified marriage. But anyway, Henry and Nancy were allowed to be married. Now, um, within about a year of their marriage, they were sold off to a very cruel um, master and an even crueler wife. And so they had a lot that they had to deal with. Now, they had been sold and purchased again a couple different times um, over the years. And during that time, they had three children together. Now, the, the, the last slave owner they had, Henry actually made a deal with the slave owner to try to keep his family together. He didn't want his wife or his children sold off. And so the slave owner says, I'm going to make you a deal. If you could pay me the cost of what your wife would be to sell, or half of the cost, then I will keep her around. I'll keep her close by. So Henry says, well, okay, okay, well, whatever it takes. So he works, he tries to make some money, gives the slave master the money, and then the slave master continues to increase the price. Continues to say, no, it's not enough, it's not enough, I want this, I want that. And Henry continues to do whatever he can to keep In his family cycle. together. Now, ultimately, the slave master sold his wife and his children. Um, and I want to read a, a little insert um, to, to read the actual words and feelings that came from Henry when he saw his family be auctioned off. And because it's so powerful to understand these emotions... So he had just, oh gosh, sorry, this is just, it's crazy, but he had just literally watched his children being walked across and having them sold in chains and him not being able to do anything about it. So now he talks about his wife. He says, I looked for the approach of another gang in which my wife was also loaded with chains. My eyes soon caught her precious face, but gracious heavens, that glance of agony may God spare me from ever again enduring. I seized hold of my wife's hand while my mind felt unutterable things. I went with her for about four miles, hand in hand. Both our hearts were so overpowered with feeling that we could say nothing. And when at last we were obliged to part, we looked of mutual love, which we exchanged was all the token which we could give each other that we should one day meet again in heaven. And this is after he watched his children torn apart in chains and sold and separated. And he looked at his wife knowing this would be the last time he would ever see her. I mean, I, I can't even, oh gosh. <laughs> Rough. My, my children and you are my whole world. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that pain. I just, I, I, I can't even imagine. But after this happened, um, whew, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be sorry, baby. Oh goodness. Okay, so after after this happened, he uh, he contemplated suicide many times, but then he realized one day that his life would be better served by telling his story and the stories of other slaves like him. So now here's where the funny part comes in. <laughs> Got to have a little humor. Whoo! It's such a tragic story. So, in 1849, 
He fled Virginia, where he was living, by mailing himself (laughs) in a custom-made dry goods box, curled in a fetal position. Now, he was over six feet tall, so you know this was not going to be easy, but he, he curled himself in a fetal position for 27 hours while he made his way to Philadelphia and to his freedom. That wasn't nothing but a work day for him. I mean, <laughs> he mailed himself to freedom. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> you got to take that in for a second because, I mean, creative beyond words, <laughs> but the desperation yeah. that he took to literally mail himself in hopes to find freedom. There's a, uh, and it's beautiful, that, that picture to me of him traveling through however means he got there it's, it's beautiful to me right I, the only thing that would have been more beautiful is obviously if they shipped themselves to the same spot right, right. but <laughs> there's a tragic photo that was i think about a year and a half ago now of a beautiful father he's fleeing to america and he has a beautiful child wrapped in his arms and they're mm-hmm. they're drowned on the edge of the water yep the refugees. And horrible things were said. I mean, the internet is undefeated. Most of the time, I laugh my ass off at the things I see. But yeah, the cruelty that was expressed on the internet about yeah. how could this man do this with his daughter, knowing that there was a high probability that they would die. His little toddler. His and toddler. People said terrible things about what a horrible parent he was, that basically he's the reason they're dead and he should be charged with child abuse had he lived. I mean, all these just horrific... Watching the, the comments flow out of white people's mouth was just disgusting to me because the truth is most of us will never, ever understand that kind of desperation. To mail yourself to freedom. That you do for that, to have that freedom, that chance to yeah. live, to survive, to to give something better to your children, you know, to not live in slavery, to not live in war-torn countries. And it, it just, it, it, there, there's such a lack of understanding um, of what that feels like to have that treatment, to feel so desperate because of how you're treated. Um, there's another story I want to read of, of, um, of Thomas Brown, another slave. And, and this, he describes a beating that he took that he said he would never forget. And he says, I was severely punished by a board cut full of holes to raise blisters. Then I was whipped with a strap to burst the blisters. Oh, okay. Then those blisters and those sores were salted and peppered. This burned me so very badly. Now he was in South Carolina and he had escaped and hidden in a nearby wooded area. And he was found by bloodhounds and brought back. And he says, I will never, ever try to run away again. I I mean... I just, (laughs) I don't even have words sometimes because I can't imagine knowing the punishment that was waiting for them. And these enslaved people still ran away. They still fled for their lives because of how horrible, how horrible we treated them. And that they were willing to risk those punishments and that pain and that suffering at the chance to possibly be free. Yeah. At possibly trying to find their, their, their loved ones and their family members again. That they were willing to go through that. Um, it just... There's a great comedy skit, I think, first performed by Richard Pryor. And uh, it was, I wish they'd take me back to slavery days. I'd make the master know I ain't going to be no slave. Right. And then... Yes, I'm not where am I going? <laughs> because people don't realize the reality of the cruelty of the era to break you, to make you submit, and how quickly one just fights to preserve their life, you know? And Well, you know, a lot of people don't even know, too, that, um, it's interesting, 
another story we weren't taught, but after slavery ended, a lot of slaves took out ads in newspapers, freed slaves, and they they listed they their family members, their spouses, their children, in hopes that they could find them after slavery was over. And I mean, these are people who were searching for their family that w were torn apart, that they put ads in papers trying to find them. And of course, most of them were never found, but these were people trying to find their loved ones to put back their families, you know, and it just, oh, it's just heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> All of this. Right. To maintain a status quo. Yep. Of white dominance yeah. over black slaves. It's, it, it's unbelievable, really, to me to think that that's, that's what this was all about, you know, about control, about power. And, you know, and, almighty dog. Right. And actually in 1850, a publication was printed in the local paper on how to produce the ideal slave was what it said. Um, and I'm going to read you some of the things that were included because it's crazy. So it says maintain strict discipline and unconditional submission. Create a sense of personal inferiority so slaves know their place. Install, instill fear in the minds of the slaves. Teach the servants to take, their, take an interest in their master's enterprise. And ensure that the slave is uneducated, helpless, and dependent by depriving them of the access to education and recreation. That is how you maintain it. And that apparently is how you maintain the ideal slave. Heartbreaking. So here it brings us to the truth. Yeah. What do we as America need to do to embrace the reality of slavery that we might teach it afresh and anew? Mm -hmm. So that we can bring about change. Nobody wants to bring about tears just to bring about tears. And right. nobody's interested in bringing about guilt just to bring about guilt or shame just to bring about shame. Yeah. It's important, however, that America begins to teach the truth. Yeah. Unfold some of that. So when I actually started looking at history um, and uh, some statistics and, and school education, um, it was quite interesting what I learned. <laughs> what I learned. So less than 40% of students have any true understanding of how slavery and white supremacy shape the fundamental beliefs of American of Americans about race. I mean that's just crazy that that many students don't understand how our history created what we currently believe about race in this country. Mm -hmm. Less than 50% of teachers are actually comfortable teaching about slavery. Only, you're right, they're uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it. They don't right. want to teach it. Um, only 8% of 12th grade students could identify that slavery was the actual cause of the Civil War. That it wasn't just about states' rights. Um, Teachers were also quoted as saying that they feel slavery is too violent to teach children. So let's just not talk about it. Let's just sugarcoat it. We'll skip over the, the violent parts. We'll just make it so they don't feel emotions about it because it's too violent. We don't want to talk about it. It just is astounding, the lack of education in this country because it's uncomfortable to talk about the truth. I mean, look, just recently, prior to Trump's exit of the White House, he was trying to enforce the post-Civil War history education in this country. And you know why he was trying to push that? Let me break it down for you. Because post-Trump Civil or post-Civil War history means that they want students to continue to believe that the electoral college system is a fair system to all Americans. They sure do. The enormous wealth gap which is based on the three-fifths. It is based on the three-fifths. The enormous wealth gap between white and black people is due to black people just not working hard enough. You they know, don't work as hard as white people. I believe it was his son-in-law that actually said 
Trump wants it really bad for you. He wants you to succeed really bad, bad black America. But he just can't want it more for you than you do. Yep. And the other reason is because black people are inherently more violent, which is why prisons are overrun by black people. (laughs) So these are all the narratives that Trump wanted to continue to enforce in this country by eliminating pre-Civil War history, true slavery history. The truth is we just can't allow this to continue anymore. I mean, there's schools all across this country that use slavery scenarios and basic math stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have this many slaves and you take away this or this, I mean, the, the word slave dehumanizes people, which is why they were not called enslaved people. They were called slaves. And when you dehumanize something, you no longer feel anything and they are no longer of value to you. They are property. They are cattle. And we are in the state we are in in this country today with the rise of terrorist organ, domestic terrorism with white supremacist groups. And we are where we are with a president that preached hate and division because this country hid the truth of what we did because they were embarrassed. It was dark. We don't want to talk about the the deep, deep, dark secrets that we committed, the atrocities we did in the name of freedom, in the name of rebuilding this great country. Why would we want to talk about the negative that we did? We want to be great. We're the greatest nation in the world, right? You know? And because of the uncomfortableness and having to actually acknowledge the truth of what we did in this country, the fact that this country was built off the torture, the rape, the brutalization, the dehumanization of an entire race of people so we could have what we wanted. And then we... Don't even acknowledge that most of it even happened. We don't want to talk about it. It's not appropriate, right? And we want to further the narrative that black people, well, they're just lazy. They're just violent. They're criminals. That's why the prison systems are overrun. You know, it's their fault. they, they, They play the victim all the time, right? They just need to pull themselves up and work as hard as white people. And they can have the American dream too. But how can you have these things on a system of 400 years of slavery and oppression and systemic systems built to continue the enslavement of black people in this country, of people of color in this country. You have to learn the truth. You have to tell the truth and you have to own it. It's not pretty, but it is our history. We can't just make it go away like it never happened because it is part of the founding of this country. This country is a great country because of its people. Every person of every color contribute to this great country. But we have to be honest with ourselves and we have to be honest with the world of where that came from, how that was built. Because then we have to finally, truly address the issue of white supremacy in this country. And that it is a cancer that is eating this society. It is a cancer that is taking away from the greatness that this country can truly be. And I know that I will never, ever again think to myself that they should just get over it. Slavery happened so long ago. I didn't enslave them. You know, why are they still so angry? And I am ashamed to fully admit and acknowledge that those words have come from my mouth. Because I didn't understand. I was ignorant to the truth of what white people did in this country. The atrocities we committed and the fact that we hid it from our generations to come 
so that they would, they would never know how dark our history really is. And that way we can continue to further the narratives that we want in this country. And I am not sharing these things with you, Richard. We are not sharing this with, with our viewers to bring shame, as Richard said, to bring guilt, to say that I am ashamed that I am white because that is not the case. I am not ashamed that I'm white. I am very happy with who I am and who I was created to be, but I am ashamed at my lack of initiative that I had to seek out the truth That's good. for myself, to not just take what I was being told, what I was being taught at face value and use that as an excuse to judge the black communities in this country, to judge another people and say that I understood their suffering or that I had the right to say, well, they've suffered, it's okay, it was long ago, they just need to get over it. Because that is not my place to say that, nor is that right on any level to say that. And my hope is that you learn something from this because this was a tough video for me. This, this was a tough, topic to research and I, I wanted so badly to do it because I wanted for for truth to finally get out there for people to start really realizing there was so much more to the stories that we've been taught and they are so much more horrific than most of us could ever imagine and I had several days of just being in tears as I researched stuff and read stories and and learned learned what we did and but it's something that we need to take accountability for mm -hmm. it is something that white america has never taken accountability for i mean we have senators that said it was a necessary evil <laughs> right don't even get me started on that one <laughs> but we have people who have justified slavery justified the treatment of black people in this country and people of color in this country and they have made excuses over our behavior and they have turned it and called everybody else the violent people everybody else the lazy people everybody else the problems but we were the problem we were the cancer of the society and we need to own it we need to accept responsibility that while you and i may have not done this if we don't acknowledge its history and the truth of it and the content continuation of the systemic racism in this country we are complicit in the continuation of that so we have to be the voice that our forefathers wouldn't be we have to be the voice of truth and the voice of honesty and openness and say you know what this happened we did this but we're going to make this right so powerful we're going to own this and we want to change the future for our children. And the only way that we can do that and bring true unity and find peace in this country is to own our part in its history. You know, they say oftentimes that our greatest message is out of our greatest mess. <laughs> that our greatest testimony is out of our greatest test. And for us as Americans, there is no shame. There's no guilt. You shouldn't walk around. Uh, white people, Caucasian people, honkies, whatever you want me to call you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just making a little bit of a light of it. I'm, 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 I feel passionate about what you shared. Yeah. I'm thankful for it. But imagine this for a moment. We don't ask you to slow down, white America. We don't ask you to slow down to let us catch up. Yeah. We're not asking you to give up so that we can go up. Keep climbing. Keep reaching higher. Keep going hard. Yeah. Keep coming up with inventions. Keep reaching to take us from the moon to Mars. But imagine for a moment, you, instead of kicking back truth, you just let truth flow and you start to lift those that you can lift. Yeah. You begin to teach those that you can teach. They say, um, I would never give a man a fish but I'll teach a man to fish. Mm -hmm. So he's never hungry again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, just stop being a hypocrite. Yep. <laughs> and teach a few people how to fish. Yeah. If you own a gym, teach a black man how to run a gym. Yeah. If you're a doctor, 
Teach a black man to become a doctor. If you're a lawyer. Yeah. If you're if you're a teacher, an educator. If yeah. You're, stop stop with the lie. Stop with yeah. the the it's not my fault bullshit. Yep. It's your it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Yes. We have a responsibility. You say, well, why is it my responsibility? Because you have a reason and you have an ability. Mm-hmm. The reason is you're a human being. Yeah. And the reason is they're a human being. You have a responsibility and you have an ability. You have an ability with a reason attached to it to reach back. But you know why most people don't live up to their responsibility? Why? They never reason. Yeah. <laughs> they never reason with the truth. They never look themselves in the mirror and say, that's a good damn reason for me to get involved. My educators lied to me. My parents lied to me. The system lied to me. I'm not better. I mean, who wants to win just because you're fighting an unfair fight? Yeah. I love one of my favorite stories is a Pete, um, Pistol Pete. Pistol Pete was a hooper of all hoopers. <laughs> Played point guard with one of the best of them. Mm-hmm. And he was lied to and They said that he was the best player in the state. And he was on the best basketball team in the state. And then he messed around and saw a black gymnasium filled with black kids playing basketball. And he said, we couldn't play on this court. Yeah. So Pistol Pete made his whole team, or at least this is the legend, his dad, play the black team and end segregation of of schools, black kids and white kids. Because it doesn't do you any good to win if you're not playing against the best. Right. You can't call yourself a champion if you're holding a trophy that's made of, of fake feathers. You know, the truth is, 400 years ago, we dehumanized an entire race of people. 400 years later, we still dehumanize black people. It's time to bring an end to it. it and it's true, it's, true, it's true not only of black people, but of Native Americans. Yes, it's people true of color. Of people of color of, yes. of, from all regions of the world. It's time for us to recognize there is no supremacy. There's only emptiness and loneliness without yes. each other. Yes. And there is a few elite people at the top of the mountain who are pulling strings because they still want a slave society. Yes, absolutely. A society that is based on slavery. And you are, my friend, if you are uneducated, just as much a slave as, as, as those African Americans, yep. those black children were, just as much as the, the, the poor little girl who had her teeth knocked out of her mouth by the rocking chair of, of, of the white mother who thought she had achieved something because she owned slaves. Yeah. We're better than this. And our nation can become great yeah. if we climb higher. Yeah. So educate yourself. Everybody, I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Tiffany Thomas. And this is the Lionheart Institute Podcast. This has been a deep, profound discussion on slavery in America. Yeah. And we just scratched the surface of it. Yeah. So much more to the story. The, the transatlantic journey. The journey down to Argentina for some of our people. Yeah. The journey all around the world. Why you don't see... A black person on the Argentina soccer team. You ever wonder that? Yep, there's a reason. You ever wonder why there are no Argentina black basketball players? <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah. Research it, family. The world is full of tragedy. Yeah. But we can, tr- we, we can climb together. Let's learn from our mistakes. Let's take ownership of them. And not use guilt and shame as a reason to continue in this cycle of hate and racism. Let's own it. Let's come together. We are better than this. Let's use love and equality and rebuild this country and finally make it great. Hey, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. I I know this has been a lot. The end of our five-part series on American slavery. If you haven't had a chance to watch some of the other videos, be sure you go back. You don't want to miss out. Um, on the the topics that we talk about. This is a much bigger topic than even what we dived into, um, but it would take a long time to talk about that as a whole. Um, You know, so for now, we we wanted to bring you some truth, some enlightenment, because with education and truth, we can make changes in this country. We can unite together as one people, and that's really what it's all about. It is, and as they say, the truth shall set you free. Absolutely. Absolutely. Truth hurts sometimes. Right. And, you know, these... these Especially were, the way she did. 
Damn. These were tough, and I'm not going to lie. It, it was hard to do this video, but, you know, again, as we mentioned in the video, this is not about shaming you. This is not about making you so feel good. guilty. This is not m making you... Mm feel like I'm ashamed to be a white person because that is not what this is about. This is about ownership. This is about accepting our history for what it is and understanding so that way we do not repeat it and we can grow from it. Come on. Thank you for being a part of this. I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Tiffany Thomas. And we want to thank you for being a part of the Lionheart Institute podcast. Please subscribe below. We've got Absolutely. some great material coming out in the months ahead. Uh, a lot on personal growth and development yeah. um, and helping your family get to the next level, your generations get to the next level, and leaving a legacy. So going to be some impactful things that we talk about. We're going to talk about stepping out of the darkness into the marvelous light, and we want to help you do that. So yeah. achieve at the highest level possible. God bless you, and thank you for being a part of this. See you soon.